All right. All right. I am going to get going. So hopefully if I do, you can work out your issues as soon as possible. All right, so this chapter is about cost recovery and we got a few learning objectives we need to talk about. So we're definitely gonna talk about this idea of basis some more because basis is critical to the idea of property. Uh, we're gonna talk about how we recover the cost of property and cost recovery is a pretty interesting technique. And what you're gonna find is that uh, we recover costs all the time and we don't even realize we do it. And so cost recovery, though kind of a unique tax lingo, we use it in financial accounting as well. It's just not called such. Uh, we're gonna talk about what types of cost recovery there, there is. We're gonna spend quite a bit of time on the special cost recovery rules and you'll see why once we get there. And we'll talk about amortization a bit. So amortization is like depreciation for uh, non-tangible property. What we're not going to cover, and I think I made this clear in the reading assignments, we're not gonna cover depletion. So you can just forget about natural resources. If you go work for an oil company, I apologize in advance. So the second thing I wanna make sure we understand, there were some changes enacted by uh, the tax law cuts or the tax act that was passed in late December last year. And even though in, in a way you'll see them and they're gonna feel very minor, but they actually have a significant effect on how costs are gonna be recovered on a lot of business property. And since that's the focus of this course, uh, it has some pretty significant effects. The first is the increase in bonus depreciation to 100% thus effectively creating a deduction for what we're gonna call personal property. And then the second is increase in the section 179 limits. And don't worry, we will cover both of those things. If you've read the chapter already, you have some sense as to what both of those are. We'll see how the rules have changed. I can hear someone else's voice. They probably don't know they're sharing with all of us. <laughs> if I could figure out how to mute them, I would. There we go. All right, well, we can't hear him anymore. Or at least I can't hear him anymore. Maybe you guys couldn't anyway. All right, let me close this out. Capitalize versus deduct. So uh, think about financial accounting, right? So the, the term capitalize isn't anything special, right? So it really means that when I'm, I have an expenditure, and it's on something that has a useful life that's going to last more than a year, then capitalization means you simply put it on the balance sheet rather than expense the cost immediately. That's not really that magical, right? It's just, okay, I get it. I don't expense it. I put it on the balance sheet. What ultimately happens is you recover that cost over time through depreciation, amortization, or again, depletion. And we're not doing depletion, but those are the ways at which we recover those costs over time. So I buy an asset, I use it to make widgets. Over time, the machine wears out. Uh, I need to match the cost with that machine with the revenue I'm generating from it. We think of that as depreciation. Same is true in the tax format. Now, what we're gonna see is that depreciation and amortization are prescribed methods. You're given a lot more flexibility under the financial reporting rules than you are under the tax rules, but they basically function the same. So again, businesses use these methods to recover the cost of, think of it as long-term assets. I mean, that's not entirely true. I guess it depends on your feelings about what long-term means, but assets that usually have a life of more than one year. Okay, so when we think about uh, a deduction, if we were to imagine what the journal entries are for that, which is debit expense and credit cash, which means that that deduction or expense is recognized directly onto the income statement, which means that it has no life, right? When I spend money, however, on something that does have a life, the implication is I'm going to use that to generate some future benefit. Well, that's what the definition of an asset is. So when I capitalize a cost, I just debit asset credit cash. And that asset or property is on the balance sheet because it has a life. Now, the cost of that asset may or may not be recoverable, depends on what it is. 
So the types of things that get capitalized, property, plant, and equipment, prepaid assets, which we've already talked about. Some intangibles in inventory is capitalized, right? We don't recognize the cost of inventory until we sell it through cost of goods sold. So all, the, all these share the same characteristics. First, they find their way to the balance sheet and then ultimately to the income statement. And that way to the income statement comes through a variety of methods, but one of the primary ones is depreciation or amortization. So section 162, let's break into the tax law here for a second. So what we need to do is when we incur one of these expenditures, do we capitalize it or do we deduct it? And we know 162 from chapter nine says, I can deduct all ordinary and necessary uh, expenditures paid or incurred during the year and carrying on a trade or business. However, no deduction will be allowed for any amount paid for new buildings, permanent improvements or betterments or things that increase the value of any property. So that's all the code gives us. Believe it or not, there is not a lot of distinction in the Internal Revenue Code between what you're required to deduct and what you're required to capitalize. There are a long series of regulations under both Section 162 and Section 263 that help taxpayers def define the dividing line between these two choices, but that's beyond the scope of this course. I actually covered that in a graduate level tax course. So deductions are permitted uh, where not expected, right? So there are certain times where you wouldn't expect there to be a deduction for that, and yet there is one. So for example, let's say you build a ramp uh, to allow wheelchair access to your building. So that ramp is, has a life of more than a year. It's poured from concrete or whatever you make it from. The idea is normally you'd have to capitalize that cost, but the tax code permits an immediate deduction for costs to make facilities handicap accessible. That has good policy intent. There are certain farming expenditures that you're permitted to deduct immediately. Uh, intangible drilling costs, which is related to natural resource we don't get too involved in, and R&E costs, research and experimentation. So typically you think of that as R&D, uh, but the tax rules, there's a certain part of development that doesn't fit into experimentation. And so the rules are a little bit different. We don't get too mixed up in that, but we'll cover it a little bit today. So again, there are certain costs that you can just flat out deduct, even though they, you'd think it would make rational sense to capitalize them. So we need to do a little bit of definitional stuff here on the world of tax property. So the world of property can be broken down into three areas, and we're going to talk at least initially here about two that are tangible property. So there's real property. Now, one might argue, wait a second, isn't all property real unless there's a category called imaginary property? And it's hard to believe that we would be able to deduct imaginary property in any case. But Real property is really just an old legal term, and it basically means real estate. So that's land and all the things that are attached to it. Personal property is tangible property that isn't real property. So anything that isn't nailed down, dug into, or built onto the land is personal property. Now, a house is real property, right? That's real property. That's land and the things attached to it because a house is generally attached to the land. A dining room set is not. Now, depending on the use of those, they may be personal use property or not personal use property. So don't confuse those two. Personal property is tangible property that's not real property. Personal use property is property of any kind that I use for personal purposes, not for business purposes. Intangible property is kind of like the imaginary property. So that's property you can't touch, although it usually comes in the form of some sort of contractual right, like a patent, a copyright, prepaid. Those are all intangibles. Okay, so now that we have some lay of the land, generally speaking, our basis in purchased property is the original cost that will adjust by certain installation items. So if you're looking for a general rule to follow, the general rule would usually say something like, it's the cost of the property plus all the costs required to get that property in service and functional for the use it's intended for. So it, when you think about other costs that you might chuck in, you have to chuck in sales tax, freight charges, right? So getting the property to you, installation to the extent there are installation charges and testing fees, all those become part of the basis of purchase property because they're all costs that you incur to get that property ready for its intended use. 
the basis of real property also includes settlement charges. And I usually think of those as what are the charges you incur to perfect your title to real property? So for example, in the United States, there's often a deed that you have to file with the clerk of courts. So that's your way of, of confirming that you actually own that property. And so to the extent that the law requires you to incur charges like that, those become part of the basis of your real property. For property you construct or build, uh, something called the Uniform Capitalization Rules apply. We cover those a little bit shortly. Uh, that's a little bit beyond the scope of this course, but we'll, we'll touch on it a little bit later. So BO Problem Inc. is an air filter retail chain. They purchased an old office building for 175,000 for use in expanding their current operations. And then they spent 15,000 on painting and carpeting to get the building ready for its, its opening. So two years later, uh, O Problem employees discovered some leaks in the roof. There was water damage to the inventory and they had to spend 50,000 to put a new roof on. And then every six months, uh, they pay 500 to have the carpet professionally clean. So of course they can't have their retail space look terrible. And so they have to have cleaners come in and clean the carpet, make it look nice. So the question is what of these costs do we need to capitalize into the basis of this building? So I think it's pretty safe to say that that initial cost, the 175,000 for the building, that clearly needs to be part of the basis. In addition, the 15,000 spent painting and carpeting because those costs were incurred to prepare it for its intended use, those also have to be capitalized. We do not get to expense those costs. So what about the others? So the 50,000 of re-roofing expense, that can be added to the basis that extends the useful life of the building. And the 500 cleaning, that has no effect on basis. That's routine maintenance that you would just deduct as you incur it. Okay. So we're back to Daniel and Toshland. In case you haven't noticed, I guess I like that show, or at least I did years ago. I haven't watched in a long time now. So Daniel lives in Toshland, just purchased a $100 business asset. So, but Toshland has unique rules. So these are not the real tax rules. These are the rules of Toshland. And in Toshland, you can either deduct the cost immediately, or then you can capitalize the cost of an asset and then write it off evenly or depreciate it over three years. And let's assume for a moment that Daniel has more than enough income to deduct whatever the cost of this thing is. So we, we don't need to worry about net operating losses or non-deductible costs or anything like that. So based purely on a present value approach, which approach should Daniel use? Should he immediately deduct it? Or should he capitalize it and amortize it or depreciate it over three years? Let's assume he has a 30% tax rate and a 5% discount rate. So if he deducts it immediately, well, that was a nice, that was a nice little, uh, let's do that again. Bam. Oh yeah, that's sweet. One more time. Awesome. So if he deducts it immediately, of course, he takes the cash outflow immediately, the deduction immediately, he generates $30 of tax savings. So you can think of that like he's got a $30 after tax cost. If on the other hand, he capitalizes that cost and then deducts it rateably over time, so a third, a third, a third over three years, his tax savings is $10 per year, but we know that the time value of money affects the quality of that deduction. And if we go back to module one, we knew already what the answer to this was. We accelerate deductions, it makes perfect sense for Daniel to go ahead and deduct that immediately. And this is just present value just proves that out. So this is one of the issues that taxpayers run into when it comes to purchasing or acquiring property, which is there's a, there's a strong uh, emphasis on wanting to deduct those items immediately. And yet, generally speaking, under the depreciation rules, you're not permitted to. And so what taxpayers generally are trying to do is find a way, how do I accelerate deductions? How do I accelerate deductions, right? Because we know we have that preference. So again, three different ways to recover the cost of assets. Depreciation we use to deduct the cost of tangible personal and real property other than land. Land is known as a non-wasting asset, which means that it does not depreciate over time. Amortization is what we use for intangible personal and real property other than land over a period of time. And again, depletion, which we're not gonna cover is on natural resources.
So just an FYI, when, when we said inventory was capitalized, how do we recover the cost of inventory? Well, through cost of goods sold, right? When we sell it. Same with a prepaid. How do we recover it? Well, we amortize it over time. We've already done both of those things. So when do we start cost recovery? So that happens not when the asset is necessarily purchased, but rather when that asset is placed into service. So, and we'll talk about what that means. That's when depreciation or amortization or whatever it is begins. So the cost basis will be reduced when we recover its cost through some form of cost reduction cost recovery deduction. We, I, I hinted on this uh, in the second module a while ago that said, don't worry, we're going to get to this idea of how we get to adjusted basis over simply basis. Well, here's one of the primary ways we get there. Adjusted basis is generally that asset's initial cost, right, including installation costs, less any accumulated depreciation or amortization. So if Bob buys property for 100 bucks, if no depreciation on that property is permitted, so maybe it's land, and he sells the property for $80, he clearly has a loss of $20. If on the other hand, he buys property for 100, he depreciates it for 20, then he sells it for 80. Well, Bob's already taken a $20 cost recovery deduction. As a result, he should not be able to deduct an additional loss, and he won't because what will happen is we will adjust the basis down to reflect the depreciation Bob took. So his adjusted basis will go from 100 to 80. When he sells it for 80, no gain or loss. Why? Well, he's already deducted the $20 loss through depreciation. And that's what I just described to you. Okay. So how does depreciation work? Well, in the old days, before probably any of you were alive, tax depreciation worked more or less basically just like book depreciation did. It had salvage values, it had useful lives, it had things that, presuming you remember any of your fundamental accounting or 331, uh, you remember that book depreciation has salvage values, you deducted that, and then you determined the depreciable amount, and you depreciated using double declining balance or straight line or whatever method you used. That's how tax used to work. Back in 81, the economy was tanking. And so Ronald Reagan and Congress decided to implement something called accelerated cost recovery. So think of accelerated cost recovery as representing exactly what its title meant. If you had an asset and its useful life was 10 years, well, now you got to depreciate it over five years. And they just prescribed that right? So it said, measure what the useful life of an asset is. If it's 10 years, now depreciate it over five years, therefore accelerating cost recovery. And the idea was, look, we just saw what happens with Daniel and Tosh land. If I accelerate a deduction, I lower the cost of purchasing that asset. I do so because I increase the tax savings to the current period. Okay, so then we worked our way out of 81. We worked our way out of that bad economic time. And so they modified the accelerated cost recovery system, which by the way was called ACRES. And when we modified it, we decided to call it MAKERS. So MAKERS, what it did is it said, well, we're gonna keep some of the acceleration, but not quite as accelerated as it was in 81. So they modified it a little bit, slowed it down, but it's still not straight line by any means. So again, depreciation begins when an asset is placed into service, not necessarily the date it was purchased. So if the Trump company started construction on a tower, they've incurred cost of 30 million. And some of the tower's done, but only the first three floors have received a permit to occupy, how would they determine the basis to depreciate that building? Well, because only those three floors are ready to enter into service, they're ready for their intended use, they're the only ones that are placed in the service and the only ones that would get depreciation. So we'd have to determine what is the cost of those three floors, and then we depreciate only that cost. And one method you could do that is you could take, well, what's the total number of floors of the building? Uh, maybe it's 30. If I've done with three of them, then I'd take $3 million and start depreciating. Now, in theory, your system would have to be a little tighter than that to get by the IRS, but that's the idea. So an asset's considered to be placed in service when the following elements can be proven. Number one is it's ready. So yeah, it's ready to do what it's supposed to do. It's available and it's capable of performing its intended function.
So that's when depreciation begins, because as you can imagine, there are certain things where, oh, you know, I bought a, I bought a copier. Well, chances are I plug in the copier and it works. That's when I start depreciating it. But if I'm buying a extruding machine for my manufacturing business, well, it might be something that I have delivered and then I have to install it. And maybe that even requires some construction work. And then I have to test it to make sure it works. And then finally, it would be ready uh, and capable of performing its intended function. So that's when I would start depreciation on that asset. All right. So let's, let's do a little work now. So the IRS method for calculating depreciation. This is what the IRS says you have to know. And I, I posted publication 946 as an optional reading. And you are more than welcome to go read that thing. I think it's about 120 pages long. And this is what it's going to tell you. You have to know the depreciation system. Then you need to know the property class. Then you need to know when it was placed in service. You need to know the basis amount, the recovery period, the convention, and the depreciation method. That's the IRS method. What's my method? What's the proper table? Done. We're done. That's it. We just got to figure out what is the right table to use. So recall that depreciation is very prescribed by the IRS. There's not a lot of flexibility. So what we need to understand is once we've established what the right table is, then it's just a simple matter of math. So the IRS publishes makers tables and they basically list the percent that you should recover through depreciation each year. So we're going to use seven primary tables and all these tables are in your table pack. Congratulations to me. I got it right for once. So there's personal property with a half year convention, personal property with a mid quarter convention for each quarter. Real property that's residential and real property that's non-residential. And in, in the world of business property, that covers 99% of all property that's going to be placed in service. Unless you happen to be in the farming industry or you happen to be in oil and gas or something like that, a very unique, or utilities, they usually have uh, something unique. I'm just checking my, okay, nothing. All right. Okay, so the first four apply to personal property, and the last two apply to real property. And they're in the name, so that should be pretty obvious. Are there other tables? Oh, yeah. There's tons. The IRS publishes a bajillion depreciation tables. Um, but again, some of them are pretty arcane, and we're just not going to cover them in this course. These are the ones we're going to use. Okay, so let's start with personal property depreciation. So personal property includes all tangible property that isn't real property. So that's computers, autos, furniture, machine, equipment, anything not real property, that's personal property. Uh, we've already discussed this, what's personal property versus personal use property. So my car, personal property. My, my car could be personal use property if I don't use it for business purposes. And we know that commuting from uh, chapter nine, commuting doesn't qualify. My house, you generally think of as personal use property. But if I happen to rent out my house, then that could be real property subject to depreciation. Okay, so an office building is real property, but it's generally not personal use property because an office building is by default business property. All right, so what is the depreciation methods that are available for personal property? Well, there's double declining balance, 150% declining balance, and straight line. The general method used is 200% declining balance. So I'm sure all you guys remember how to do your double declining balance from financial accounting. I don't. It does happen to be on the back of my, my calculator. I, I can't read that, but it's on there. Um, but don't worry. Tables are going to take care of us. The tables are going to take care of us. So use of what's called the alternative depreciation system and the straight line systems are limited. Those are actually elections you can make. So let's say you worked for a biotech company here in San Diego, and it turns out you're making no money, which that's not uncommon for a biotech startup. You're really not interested in accelerating cost recovery because it's just creating NOLs. So you may elect the alternative depreciation system, which is slower depreciation, or you can go full-blown straight line, which is even slower depreciation. But we're not really going to cover those. We'll talk about straight line when we get the listed property a little bit later. Okay, so this is right out of your book. It's a nice table, and it talks about how the IRS has defined depreciation under makers. 
okay? So the, the columns we're most interested in are the general recovery period column in the class life. But you don't need to worry about this. This is something I, I tell every class. I am not going to force you to memorize the general recovery periods for any uh, property that you have to depreciate in this course. That just doesn't make any sense. I mean, as it turns out, by the time you're done, you probably will have memorized some of them anyway, because most of it is either five or seven year, but that's not the point. There's just there, I make you guys memorize enough. So for tax purposes, basically, remember I said we have this modified accelerated cost recovery. So let's look at office furniture in that table. So apparently office furniture, the class life is 10 years. So what that means is a kind, of, kind of according to the IRS's economist, office furniture should last about 10 years. The recovery period is actually the period under which you will recover the cost through depreciation for tax purposes. So you can see it's accelerated, right? If you happen to elect the ADS method, it would only be 10 years, but again, we're not doing that. Look at, uh, as a contrast, look at the light general purpose trucks, which actually have a four-year life uh, in real life, if you will, but the IRS is making us depreciate those over five years. Again, prescribed methods, you don't have a choice. All right, so common asset lives, uh, the things on top, cars, trucks, computers, per per peripheral equipment, that's all five years. Uh, office furniture, fixtures, machinery, and equipment, that's all seven years. So when you think about the world of personal property, that covers a ton of it right there. Just those two categories. So that's why I say we mostly do five and seven. But again, you're not going to be required to know those. So let's look at an example where property can be placed in service any time of year, right? So I'm operating a business and these are the, pro the properties I placed in service during the year. So I put a machine in service in January. I put some furniture in service in March. A computer in service July. Another machine in September and some fixtures in October. And I can go back to my table and identify the useful life for each of those items. And now it's time to calculate depreciation. So it would be under the double declining balance method for the first year, you take the cost of that item, you multiply it by 200%, you divide it by its useful life, then you multiply that in this case by the number of days during the year. Right, so you could do that for the first machine and you'd have to count the number of days from the 17th to the end of the year. You could do it again in March. You'd have to count the number of days from March 25th to the end of the year. That's 281 days. You get to the computer and you'd be like, screw this, this is ridiculous. Counting days doesn't make any sense. And this is particularly relevant uh, for you young folk who, uh, it was much harder to count days. Like you can do that now on the internet, go to timeanddate.com and it will calculate days for you. Um, but in the old days, you just didn't have that option. And so the IRS said, well, we need to come up with a way to make this easier for taxpayers. And they decided that the way they're gonna do that is through something called a convention. And the general rule is a half year convention. And under the half year convention, it says, I don't care when you placed that property in the service. This is all personal property, by the way. You take a half year's depreciation. So you place it in service in January, take a half a year. Place it in service March, half a year. September, half a year. December, half a year. Right? So this is a simplifying technique that the IRS used originally, but it is prescribed. You do not have a choice. You can't say, well, I get more depreciation if I use number of days. It doesn't matter. You use the half year uh, convention because that's the general rule. Okay, so let's think about the way taxpayers behave. They look at this and they're like, oh wow, I get a half year for everything I place in the service. Well, that's a pretty sweet deal. Why don't I look at everything I was gonna place in service in January of next year? Why don't I place that in service in December? Because think about it, I've accelerated that deduction for a whole year and I get a whole half year's depreciation on it in that year, even though it's only been in service for a month. So the idea is, wow, that's an easy way. This half year is super convenient, but it's very crude measure. It doesn't give an accurate depiction of the number of days that that property has been in service. So then this, the IRS had to come along and say, all right, taxpayers, we see what you're doing. So we need to make a better rule, right? If you're going to take 
a half year's depreciation for something you placed in service for only one month, we're going to try to identify taxpayers that are doing this sort of thing, that are basically abusing our simplification rule. So how are we going to define this rule? Well, we're going to call it the mid-quarter convention. And what we're going to do is we're going to identify taxpayers who are overloading the fourth quarter of the year with new assets placed in service. So we need to find out because there are abusing pool, right? Because really, over time, property should be placed in service rateably every month. It should be randomly distributed in a uniform fashion across all years and all months. So we need to find out who's abusing that. Well, how much are we going to measure? Well, if on a random basis, 25% would be placed in service in the fourth quarter of the year, then we know it's got to be more than 25%. And the number they came up with was 40%. So what happens is you look each year at the amount of personal property that a taxpayer placed in service. If more than 40% of the property for that year was placed in service in the fourth quarter, that taxpayer is required to use the mid-quarter convention for everything placed in service that year. So we take the sum of the total basis of tangible personal property placed in service during the year. We take the sum of the total basis of tangible personal property placed in service in the fourth quarter of the year. And that could depend on when the fiscal year end of that business is, right? So if you're a calendar year end, that's clearly October, November, December, but you can have a fiscal year corporation. Divide step by one. If it's more than 40%, then you have to use mid-quarter or else the general rule is what sticks. So you could spend 39% and still use half year convention. You could actually spend exactly 40% and still use the half year convention. The second you get to 40.01%, you must use the mid quarter convention. Okay, so again, general rule, half year convention, the exception, mid quarter convention. You apply this test once annually at the end of the year. So what that means is you do not know what your tax depreciation method is going to be until you get to year end. Let's do an example because there is no other way to do it. So Jane placed uh, service personal property as follows. Oh, shoot. See, this is the problem. My little screen here is covering that up. Let me see if I can get rid of it. Boom. There we go. All right. So here we go. March, uh, April, October. There's my 2017 totals. And then in uh, February and June of 18, she placed in service the following. So what we would say is, well, we need to look at 17 first to determine if this is all personal property. What is uh, the convention that's going to apply in 2017? Well, I'd look at what is the amount I placed in service in the fourth quarter? Well, that's 4,000. What's the total? 4,300. That's clearly more than 40%. For those three assets, the March, the April, and the October 17 assets, I'm going to use the mid-quarter convention. For 2018, however, I didn't place anything in service in the fourth quarter. As a result, that is clearly less than 40%. So for those two assets, I'll use the half-year convention. That convention will apply for the entire life of the asset. So even though 2017 was a mid-quarter convention, that applies to those three assets. That applies to those three assets in 2018, in 2019, in 2020, until they're fully depreciated. For the 2018 assets, it's the half-year convention until they're totally depreciated. All right. So here's what a uh, snapshot of the table is out of your book. Uh, I personally like the, the table pack versions better, but if you like the book versions, that's cool too. Whatever's quicker to get your hands on works fine. So we're going to use these tables in a second uh, to show how they work. All right. So here we are. It's late 2017. Mom's Garage is looking back and says, you know what? We had a pretty good year. Uh, we don't need that much income. And here's what we placed in service in 2017. So in July, they put a couple things in service, right? A tire balancer, some testing equipment. Uh, in May, they put a computer into service. In January, a copier and some other equipment in October. So that's what's placed in service. And here it is, December. And mom isn't dumb. She's looking at it and she's saying, all right, well, I think I might want to put one more new piece of property in service. Um, and I might do it this year or maybe I'll wait and do it next year. So what we need to do is figure out, you know, 
what's the better option here for mom? Should she put it in the service tomorrow or should she wait and place it in the service next year? Okay, so we'll look at this and say, all right, let's do part one first. Let's calculate her depreciation, assuming she goes ahead with the purchase of this new equipment in December, uh, seven-year property for 4000 And then after that, we'll go through the second. All right. So the first thing we need to do is the convention test. So here's our list of uh, property that we purchased. And notice now that it is listed chronologically. So I have it in January, May, two Julys, and October, and this new December equipment that we're thinking of buying. So we know that the convention test says identify what you placed in service in the fourth quarter, and then take that and divide it by the total amount placed in service during the year. So 14,000 plus four is 18,000. Total assets purchased for the entire year is 43.5. 18 divided by 43.5, that's more than 40%. So mom's going to need to use the mid-quarter convention. Okay, got it. Now I understand what table I need to use, I think, except it's mid-quarter convention. So we got to go find those tables. Let's start with the copier. Okay, so what is the convention? Mid-month, we just proved that out. What quarter was the copier placed in service? Well, it was placed in service in January. That's the first quarter. What is the recovery period? Well, I'm telling you, it's five years. Okay, so I need to go find the right table in my table pack. And I can tell you, if you have your table pack handy, you ought to just see if you can find it yourself because, yeah, you're going to need to do it in the exam. And so getting used to identifying the right table pack makes a lot of sense. In any event, I'm going to do it for you. It looks like this, right? In your table pack, it's table A2. And it says three, five, seven, 10, 15, and 20 year property, mid quarter convention placed in service in the first quarter. It's five year property. It's in its first year because we just bought it. There's my depreciation factor, 35%. So I take the cost of the copier, which was 1500, I'll multiply it by 35%. I get $525. That's the copier's depreciation in 2017. So that's really as simple as it is, but just to be safe, let's do another example. What about the computer? So we know the convention's mid-quarter. When was the computer placed in service? If we flip back, the computer was placed in service in May. Therefore, that is a second quarter asset. Let's flip back forward. The recovery period for a computer is five years. So we go to the table. We find the one for the second quarter, five year, first year, it's 25%. 25% times the cost of the computer is $750. That's my depreciation in 2017. So normally what I would do now is I would say, you guys go do the rest of the property. If you really want to do it, if you're obviously, if you're watching the live lecture, I'm not going to give you that option. But if you're watching the taped version of this, you ought to go do the rest of the property yourself right now. Seriously, you should, even though, yeah, I know the solution's on the next slide. That's not the point. Practice makes perfect. Okay. So let's assume you did uh, go out and do it. Again, if you're on a live lecture, probably don't have the time. Here would be your solution. So I went through all the tables and I identified, we had already done the copier and the computer. Uh, we used the third quarter table for the testing equipment, the tire balancer. Those were seven year recovery periods. So I just found the first year uh, depreciation factor and multiplied those out. And then for the items placed in service in the fourth quarter, I use the fourth quarter uh, mid-quarter convention table for seven-year items. I pulled in the depreciation factor and did the math. So depreciation, when, it really, when, you, when you really boil it down to it, this is why I say it's just about finding the right table. And then afterward, it's just math. Okay, so what if she does not buy the asset, right? So recall that we were, we were dealing with this issue where she was going to add that asset in December. Well, now she's not going to. So to practice a little more, let's redo the depreciation on this table. So now the total assets purchased during the fourth quarter are only the one asset for 14000 Total assets purchased are only thirty nine five. Now we're less than 40%. So it's only the half year convention. So the half year convention is great because that's one table in your table pack and it applies to everything and you just gotta find the right recovery period. So here's half year convention. If we're looking at five year property, it'd be, for example, the copier, it'd be 20%. If we're looking at the computer, it's 20%. So you should be able to do the rest of this property 
really easily. So again, if you're on the live lecture, you have no choice on moving forward. If you're on the tape lecture, my suggestion is you pause, you go do it now. All right, so if you uh, recalculated everything, you can see that half year convention is a little more simplistic because all those seven year assets have the same depreciation factor. All the five year assets have the same depreciation factor. All the 10 or 15 or 20 year assets, they'd all have the same depreciation factor because it's a half year convention. Doesn't matter when you placed it in service, it all gets a half a year. And of course I set this problem up to work this way, but if you look, her total depreciation is actually more if she does not buy the equipment. That is precisely what the mid-quarter convention is designed to do. It's designed to prevent you from accelerating depreciation by placing it in service at the end of the year and taking a half-year convention on everything. Okay, so let's just for practice do year two. And of course, we need to start with a copier. All right, so you, year two, Five-year property is 32%. That's easy enough. But remember, we're using the double declining balance method. This is where students frequently get tripped up. The tables are not built to consider double declining balance, meaning 32% of what? Do I have to decline the previous balance? Okay, so if it costs me $100, I'm down to 80? No. You take the original depreciable basis. The table bakes into all its factors the double declining balance method. So you take 1500 for the copier, multiply it by 32%, that's $480. The computer, 3000 times 32%, that's $960. If it were seven year property, it would all be multiplied by 24.49% from the table. All right, so think of the rule here is kind of like when you start in a column, you just stay in a column until it's fully depreciated. You don't ever leave that column for any particular asset. Once you start in it, you finish in it. Okay, so there's a couple of things that are worth noting here. The first is because of the half year convention, a five year asset actually takes six years to depreciate. So I take a half year in year one, then I take a full year, a full year, a full year, a full year, and then a half year in year six. And a seven year asset would take eight years. And if you look back at those tables, you'll see that that's true. They extend down for an extra year on each one of them. That's just how tax depreciation works. Okay, so the table I just told you takes care of whatever the convention is in the first year. And it takes care of it in all the other years. And it does so unless one thing happens, which is you dispose of the asset before the end of its useful life. Okay, so let's do a little mathematical proof. And so for those of you that are math nerds who really love to follow it, follow along for the next few minutes. For those of you that are like, yeah, no, I'm good with the tables, brah. You can just like zone out during this part if you're not zoned out already. All right, so I have a one-year asset, five-year life. So under the double declining balance method, I divide it by its useful life of five years. I multiply it by 200%. And then under the half-year convention, I multiply by a half, I get 20%. Does that agree to the table? And the answer is, yeah, that does agree to the table, okay? So just to prove it out, in year two, if we're using true double declining balance, I'm down to 80 cents, right? So the dollar of original cost minus the 20 cents of depreciation from the previous year, divide by five, multiply by two. There's no half year convention. I get a full year in year two, that equals 32%. And does that agree to the table? Yeah, you better believe it does. In year three, now my declined balance is down to 48 cents. Divided by five, multiply by two, multiply by one, 19.2. Does that agree to the table? Yeah, it does. Year four, now my declined balance is down to 28.8 cents. Divided by five, multiply by two, times one. Does that equal the table amount? Yeah, it does, even if you haven't been checking it. Year five. Now my decline balance is down to 17.28 cents, divided by five, multiplied by two, times one, I get 6.912. If you had been checking, you would know that does not agree to the table. So what happens is these tables are built and the law is built, and it says the second that straight line depreciation becomes advantageous over double declining balance, then you switch to straight line. 
So that's built into the tables. If I redo year five on a straight line basis, recall that at the beginning of year five, I've got a year and a half left of the life. Because remember, it's not, it's not five years, it's actually six years because I got that extra half a year at the end. So I, I take the decline balance, multiply by a year and a half, that would give me 11.52. Guess what? That agrees to the table because that's the way the tables work. Now, again, that's only a mathematical proof. I'm never gonna ask you to do any of those calculations. There's simply no need to because the table takes care of it. And in, I can tell you in real life that most businesses buy software to do these calculations for them. So yeah, we're gonna spend some time on the mathematical calculations, but know in the long run, hopefully you have a software that takes care of this problem. All right, now let's shift from personal property to real property. Okay, because real property tends to be expensive, right? Land and buildings cost more than a desk. Land and buildings cost more than a car. So because of that, and they tend to live longer lives, right? A computer might last five years. Frankly, that's kind of a long time for a computer. Three years to me fits a little better. But let's say a computer lasts five years. Well, a building can last 40 years. It can last 50 years. The Empire State Building is 100 years old, right? So these buildings, it's not really, but they can last a long time. So the idea is because they last a long time, we're not going to allow this half year or mid quarter convention to apply. Instead, you have to use a mid month convention. The mid month convention says you're going to treat it as if you placed it in service halfway through the month in which you placed it in service. So notice this table. This is non residential real property. It's a 39 year straight line life. All real property is straight line. And you can see that there is a column for every month. So if Michelle places in service an apartment, May 2017 at a cost of $100,000. Okay, well, it's the first year. It's May. In theory, she would use 1.605 and multiply that by 100,000. But what kind of property did Michelle place in service? It was an apartment. This is the non-residential real property table we have the wrong table. So what we need to do is go find the right table, right? So the residential real property would apply, but it functionally works the same. She places it in service, she multiplied by 2.273, her depreciation would be $2,273. Okay, so you can see the, the way depreciation is gonna work, at least for this class, is it's all about finding the right table. And you're either going to find the half year or the mid-quarter convention tables for personal property, and you're going to find one of the two real property tables for real property. All right, so something to look out for, and this is just, it's a mistake you guys make, and I just don't want you to make it. So look at those depreciation factors out in October, November, and December in year one. So I just want to make sure you understand that that 0.55% is not 0.55. That's 0 0.00455. So that depreciation on a $100,000 asset that was placed in service in November, if it's residential real property, is only $455. So just don't make that mistake. It's just a decimal problem. But if it happens to be a multiple choice question, you're just going to get it wrong. Okay, so how does real property affect that convention test? Remember, we did the convention test where we stacked up uh, the real property, or sorry, the property placed in service in the fourth quarter divided by the total property. Real property does not affect the convention test at all. All real property is mid-month, so it shouldn't even get mixed up in the convention test for personal property, and it doesn't. Do not make the mistake of using real property when you're calculating either the numerator or the denominator of the convention test. Okay, so Beth placed in service the following. Looks like we got some furniture in February, a machine in July, a building in November. If I'm calculating the convention test because the building is real property, I have nothing placed in service in the fourth quarter. Therefore, the half year convention would apply to the furniture and the machine. The building we know is on the mid-month convention anyway. 
Okay, so I've told you that this table automatically builds in either the half year, the half quarter, the half month, whatever it is for the year you place it in service, right? And we proved that. That was that mathematical proof that you slept through a couple slides ago that showed that, yeah, the double declining balance, if I calculate it out each year, it actually does tie to the table amount, including the half year convention or whatever convention applies. That's super convenient and it's great because the table knows that anytime you place an asset in service, that has to be its first year. I, I, I don't have a time machine, right? I'm not Doc Brown and, and I don't have a DeLorean that I can fly forward and get the sports back bet from, uh, from Crazy Biff. So anytime I place an asset in service, yeah, that's its first year. That doesn't work with disposals, right? A taxpayer can get rid of an asset, either sell it or abandon it at any time. They could abandon it in its first year, in its second year, its third year, its 20th year. The tables have no idea when you're gonna dispose of an asset. So what that means is we have to manually intervene with the tables when we dispose of an asset. This is important because it's frankly, it's a little bit complicated. So when an asset is sold, Whatever convention that applied in the year of purchase or placed in service is also going to apply in the year of disposal. So for example, if I had the half year convention when I placed it in the service, I have to use the half year convention when I take it out of service. If it's mid quarter in, mid quarter coming out, mid month going in, mid month coming out. Okay, so we, we really just need to do an example of this. I, I don't know of any other way to do it. So Gordon placed a seven-year asset in service in 2015. It cost $10,000. It was used in a trader business. There's no bonus or 179, so we'll talk about those later, but this is just simplifying assumption. The half-year convention applied uh, during 2015. He then sold that asset in January of 17. So what we need to do is figure out how do we calculate depreciation for 2017, the year in which he sells the property. So notice he sold it on the very first day of the year. Okay, so let's start at the beginning though, right? If we start back in 2015, that was year one, and I would have depreciated using 14.29, and we know the table builds in that half-year convention, right? That already reflects a half-year convention. I get to year two, that's 2016. I get a full year's depreciation, that's the 24.49%. Now I'm in 2017. If I go to the table amount, 17.49, that's a whole year's worth of depreciation. But I don't get a whole year's worth of depreciation. I only get half a year's worth because I have to apply the same convention going out that I applied going in. So if the half year convention applied during year one, it also applies in year three. So I take the 10,000, multiply it by a whole year's worth of depreciation, 17.49, then multiply that by half. Get 874.50, that's the amount of cost recovery in 2017 for this particular property. All right, so now let's do the same thing except mid-quarter. So in this case, Stuart placed in service a seven-year asset, 2015, 10,000. But in this instance, the mid-quarter applied to the year in which he placed it in service. And let's assume he placed it in service in the third quarter of 2015. And again, he sells it January 1st, 2017. We've got to figure out what is Stuart's depreciation in 2017. All right, so here's our table. Here's mid-quarter convention placed in service in the third quarter. We have seven-year property. So back in 2015, we would have used 10.71. 2016, 25.51. 2017, the factor is 18.22. But does that represent the full year or the part year he's supposed to get? Well, that's a full year. Okay, well, we know full year isn't right. So some way we have to scope that down to reflect only the mid-quarter convention applying. So we would say, when did he sell that asset? Well, he sold it on January, which is in the first quarter. So should we fitch, switch to the Q1 table? And the answer is unequivocally no. When we start in a column, we stay in a column, period. So we need to take that 10,000, multiply it by 0 0.1822, and then we say, okay, I took it out of service in the first quarter. I get half a quarter for that quarter or 0.5 divided by four, 227.75 is the amount of depreciation Stuart gets to reflect.
Okay, so the magic on this one is, what's that 0.5 over four? Where'd that come from? Let's work on that a little bit, okay? So applying that convention to the disposal, very common mistake, right? So let's think about that asset we just covered, 10-year asset seven, three years ago, disposed of in Q1. So here's the quarters of the year, right? So if I dispose of it in Q1, I know I get half a quarter. That's the mid-quarter convention. Treat it like you get half a quarter. So I get half a quarter in quarter one. How much do I get in quarter two? Well, think about it. If I don't own the asset anymore, I don't get anything. I don't get anything in Q3. I don't get anything in Q4 because I don't own the asset anymore. I disposed of it in Q1. So the answer is 0.5 over four, right? That's where that 0.5 over four comes from. All right, let's redo it instead and say we disposed of it in Q2. All right, so here's my quarterly table. How much of the first quarter do I get? Well, I get all of the first quarter. I didn't dispose of it in the first quarter, so I get all of it. But I did dispose of it in the second quarter. So I only get half of that quarter under the mid-quarter convention. In the third and fourth quarters, I didn't own it anymore. I don't get any depreciation. So when I'm thinking about the ratio that I need to use for the disposal of this asset, it's 1.5 over four. So hopefully you can see how that works. The homework is chock full of problems that have these sorts of calculations in them. So this is my favorite way of doing it. It is not atypical for me when I solve these questions to draw these boxes on whatever it is I'm using to make sure that I count the right number of quarters. Okay. So recall, would we rather capitalize the cost of an asset and recover its cost over time or deduct that cost immediately? And hopefully you're all saying to yourselves, of course, Professor Gill, we just want to deduct those costs immediately. So the, conveniently, the tax code includes two provisions that are designed to accelerate the recovery of depreciable property. One of them is called Section 179, and frankly, it just doesn't have a better name than that. I wish it did, right? But then you'd call it like the immediate, immediate expensing provisions or deduct right away provisions. But in, invariably, in the professional world for accountants, everyone just calls it Section 179. So even though I do not make you guys memorize section codes because that's just dumb. Uh, this is one because everyone calls it 179. You got to call it 179 too. The other one is called bonus depreciation. Okay, so these are two provisions designed to help me accelerate the recovery of depreciable property. So we're going to start with section 179. So section 179 permits a business to immediately expense a certain amount of otherwise capitalized property placed in service during the year. Okay, well, that sounds like a sweet deal. Remember Daniel and Toshland. We'd always rather immediately expense it. So I wish 179 applied to all property everywhere in the whole world, but it doesn't. There are some restrictions. The first is the property has to qualify. The second is the amount needs to qualify. And the last is it cannot create a tax loss. Okay, so we're going to deal with examples that go through all three of these. So for 179 to apply, it must be purchased, meaning it can't be constructed, purchased tangible personal property for use in an active trade or business and placed in service this year. New or used property qualifies for section 179. So it has to be purchased, but it can be purchased used, right? If I wanna acquire a used truck for use in my trade or business, that's fine. I could potentially take section 179. So in 2017, there was a category that also qualified for 179. It was called qualified leasehold improvements, qualified retail improvements, and qualified restaurant property. Now these were all real property. But what had happened is kind of post-financial crisis in 08, they had created these categories to try to boost these industries. So qualified leasehold, qualified retail, qualified restaurant. So this was times when they did improvements to retail property or restaurant property. They basically said, well, to encourage you to do so, we're going to allow you to immediately expense those costs that you would otherwise had to have capitalized. However, that got, boom, killed at the end of 2017. In 2018, they invented this thing called qualified improvement property. So qualified improvement property is any improvement to the interior portion of a building that is not residential real property if the improvement is placed in service 
after the building was first placed in service. Okay, so let's think about what's bound up in that one sentence because there's a lot in there. So first off, what we're looking at is this exception to the rule. 179 was supposed to be only for personal property, but they've expanded it and said, no, there's some real property we're going to let you stick in there. Number one is it's an improvement to the interior of a building. That building has to be non-residential and it can't be getting it ready for its intended use. It has to be, it was already placed in service and you decided to do a renovation to it. Okay, so that's qualified improvement property. 2018 also expanded what's permitted under section 179. And it said, okay, we know we said it's only personal property. And we know we expanded that and said, okay, well, we'll let you have some improvement property too if it's qualified. But we're gonna add these other things too roofs, heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems, fire protection and alarm systems, and security systems. All those are now eligible for Section 179. So when you think about it, a roof, the first example we did on BO problem, we said, oh, when they had to put a new roof on because they had a leaky roof, they were going to have to capitalize that cost and then depreciate it over its useful life. If you guys recall, the useful life for non-residential real property is 39 years. Now that can just be done the year you place it in service under Section 179. So this is a big benefit for taxpayers. These are the ones, like if you're looking for things that you can help your clients out with, this is one of those things. Okay, the problem was when they created this new expanded system, they got rid of qualified leasehold improvement, qualified retail, and qualified restaurant property. Now the reality is they didn't mean to, they did that accidentally but it's going to require an act of Congress to fix it. And the way Congress is functioning right now, frankly, no one believes that Congress is going to fix it. So for right now, that qualified leasehold improvement, qualified retail, qualified restaurant, that is off the board. Whether it comes back or not, maybe by the time you graduate, probably not. Okay, so what amount qualifies? Now that we know what kind of property qualifies, what amount qualifies? Well, in 2017, it was up to $510,000 qualified. That meant if I spent uh, $400,000 on qualifying property, I could immediately expense $400,000. If I spent $500,000 on qualifying property, I could immediately expense $500,000. If I spent $511,000, I could only expense 510,000 because that was the limit. It was intended, section 179 when it was written years ago, it was intended for small businesses. And if you can believe it, the maximum limit that we're talking about was $25,000. That was it. Okay, so we know what the maximum is and we know that it was intended for small businesses. So the way they decided what a small business is, is they said, okay, calculate all the qualifying property you placed in service this year. If it's more than 2 million, technically 2 million 30,000, you need to phase it out. So what that means is I had 510,000 that I could expense each year uh, in 2017 if I was a small business. Small business defined as I spent qualifying property of 2 million 30,000 or less. So if I spend $2,030,001, am I eligible for nothing? No, there's a phase out. We're going to do this phase out in a second, but it's a dollar for dollar phase out. So if I went above $2,030,000 by a dollar, $510,000 just became $509,999. So all those limits were blown away. The Tax Cuts and Job Act said we're going to expand Section 179. Now the annual limit is a million dollars. The phase out begins at two and a half million. Those amounts are adjusted for inflation each year. So anytime you see me tag something with adjusted for inflation each year, you can pretty much bet I'm not going to ask you to memorize that because it's going to be different by the time you graduate. So as a result, uh, those are already in the table pack. Let's do an example. So X Corporation places in service 1.24 million of 179 property in 2017. The qualifying property is less than 2,030,000, so there'd be no phase out. The full $510,000 would be available. As a result, they would expense all 510,000 of the 1.24. The rest of it they would have to depreciate. 
Y Corp places in service 2.3 million in 2017. Well, they have gone above the qualifying property, so the phase out is in effect. How much are they above? Well, 2.3 million minus 2.03 million is 270,000. They would need to reduce their annual amount to 510,000 by the phase out amount of 270,000. That would leave them 240,000 of immediately expensing under 179 available. Z Corp places 3 million in service. And again, these are all 2017. Note that. Okay, 3 million in 2017. Z's qualifying property causes a phase out, no doubt about it. How much? 970,000. Well, guess what? That's more than the 510. They're not eligible for any 179 immediate expensing. So that's how they create this small business limit. They say, look, it's, it's not about uh, some size of assets or anything else. We're going to focus on how much did you spend on qualifying 179 property. All right, so let's do a 2018. Z Corp places in service a million dollars of 179 property in 2018. Are they immediately for expensing? You bet, right? How much can they take? All of it. Did they go above two and a half million? No, they can take all of it. Let's do some more examples. All right. X Corp places in service 1.2 million, 2018. X qualifying property is less than two and a half million. A full million is available. Y Corp places in service 2.8 million in 2018. That's above two and a half million. Therefore, the phase out is in effect. 2.8 million minus two and a half million, which is the limit for 2018. That's an excess of 300,000. That means I have to take the million that is in effect in 2018, reduce it by 300,000. Only 700,000 of 179 is even available to Y Corp. Z Corp places in service 4.1 million in 2018. Z qualifying property causes a phase out. How much? 1.6. They don't get any. Okay. So what I did is I iterated through the three versions, both in 2017 and 2018. 2017 isn't that important to me. You can see that the way these limits and the phase outs work is identical. What changes is the dollar amounts. The book is going to force you to practice with 17 information. I'm going to ask you to complete 18 information. So I felt like I needed to give you examples of both so you could see both. All right. What about 2019? They place a million dollars in 2019. Well, we don't even know what limit exists then yet, right? That hasn't been released to us, but we know that when that limit is released, we'll know how to calculate it, right? Not for this class, but for your future life. All right. So we made it past two of the hurdles for 179. Qualifying property, and the amount. Okay, so I just got a question. Is the homework 2017 or 2018? The homework is 2017 because that book simply wasn't available, uh, obviously, when, or that information wasn't available when they wrote the book. So as a result, we are stuck with 2017 for the homework. So what I would say is it's okay, right? I know that's going to make you guys nervous and you're going to have a freak out on me, but it works the same. All that happens is the numbers change. Well, guess what? I'm changing the numbers on you anyway. So it, it'll be, it's going to be fine, right? Do the homework, practice in 17. You'll be able to apply 18 too. All right. We've made it past 179, one more to go. Remember I said that 179 cannot cause a tax loss. So let's say Betty has a 179 expensing amount that she's determined she's eligible for 500,000. The problem is Betty's taxable income for her, from her business before considering Section 179 is only 230000 As a result, her 179 deduction is limited to 230000 because the second she takes a deduction for $230,001, that creates a loss. You cannot create a tax loss with Section 179. Any amount you're not eligible to take or is limited by your income, you can then carry forward and try to deduct in the following year. Okay, we absolutely need to do examples of this. I'm going to do examples using 2018 rules. Andy Summers owns a small business. He spends $1.282 million for new furniture. Seven-year, half-year convention. I'm just giving that to you. 
He elects to take 179 on the furniture. Okay. This is the only 179 property. And in fact, it's the only property at all, just to make it perfectly clear. His income before any cost recovery at all is $4 million. So we need to determine how much of this cost recovery can Andy take under 179 and then under any other form of cost recovery that's available to him. Okay, let's start the solution. So we know that Andy has 1.282 of 179 eligible property. It happens to be his only property. So the first question we would ask ourselves is, does Andy have a phase out problem? Is he bigger than the small business limit? The small business limit is 2.5 million. Well, no, Andy only placed in service 1.282. So the small business limit is not going to cause any phase out to Andy's million dollars worth of eligible amount. However, does the amount he placed in service exceed a million dollars? Well, yeah, it does. In fact, it does by two hundred eighty-two thousand dollars. The one seventy-nine is limited to a million dollars in twenty eighteen. So, what are we going to do with the remaining two hundred eighty-two thousand? Depreciate it using makers. Okay, so let's do our makers cost recovery. It's a seven-year asset, half-year convention. I go to the first year, 0.1429 times 282,000. Maker's cost recovery on this property is $40,298. I needed to do that because the next limit is, can Andy deduct the million dollars of 179? Well, he can as long as it doesn't create a loss. So we need to check the income limitation. So income before any cost recovery was given, that was $4 million. Okay, well, I'm not very concerned. It's pretty clear he's going to have enough room for the deduction. But let's be explicit and walk through it. So what you have to calculate is what is Andy's income with every other deduction in there but Section 179? The only way you could do that is you'd say, okay, what is it? with all other forms of cost recovery. Well, the other form of cost recovery is the makers we just did. So we need to take the 4 million, deduct that amount of makers depreciation, 3.959 million. So that's still way in excess of a million dollars. So the income limitation doesn't apply. He can take all million dollars under 179. His total cost recovery on that property is $1,040,298. That's the total of his maker's depreciation plus his Section 179 cost recovery. As a result, his adjusted basis after just one year is all the way down to 241702 So you can see that this accelerated depreciation, right, if we think back to Daniel and Tosh land, this is a pretty good gig for taxpayers, right? Look how much of that cost he wrote off in just the first year. A bunch of it. Okay, so that's our first version. Let's see, I got another question coming in. This is kind of fun. I'm kind of digging the questions thing. I, there's, a, there's a lag for those of you. I don't know what pops up on your screen because I don't have it, um, but a chat came through. Where is, there it is. Can I repeat step four? Yes, I can, right? So if we look at step four, can Andy deduct a million dollars? You just need to check whether or not Andy has enough income prior to section 179, right? The rule is you cannot create a tax loss with a section 179 deduction. Well, Andy wants to take a million dollars. Why wouldn't he? Daniel and Toshland would want to take a million dollars. Andy wants to take a million dollars. Most taxpayers want to accelerate deductions and take a million dollars. So we need to make sure he's got enough income. If we look at his income given before cost recovery, that was just 4 million. I gave that to you. But we need to make sure we examine it with all deductions in there except Section 179, which means we need to deduct his maker's depreciation. That's the 40298 That 3.959 left, that's his taxable income before 179. That's clearly more than a million dollars, and he's not going to create a tax loss. So, again, that gives us total cost recovery. Don't worry, we're not done with 179. Let's do iteration two. So Andy Summers, small business, 1282, seven-year, half-year convention, wants to take 179. The only difference is his income before any cost recovery is only 750000 So look, these are, these are academic iterations that I've created. You should already know we have an income limitation problem, right? We should already know that Andy wants to take a million. He's already going to blow through more because he's only got 750000 
Okay, so now that we know that's a problem, let's walk through the steps anyway. We're gonna do it one by one. Step one, he's got 200, 1,282,179 eligible property. Does he blow through the small business limit of two and a half million? No, 1.2 is less than two and a half million. No phase out, awesome. Does the remaining eligible amount exceed the annual limit of a million dollars? Yes, it does. By how much? 282,000. So what do we do? Makers depreciate it. We already know that makers depreciation on 282,000 is $40,298. Now we need to go to the income limitation. That's where this iteration sticks. Can Andy deduct a million dollars? Man, he really wants to. He wants to deduct all of that 179 but he needs to check whether or not he's got enough income to do it. Recall that his income before cost recovery was 750,000. So yeah, it's gonna be limited. But remember, we need to calculate income before all deductions except 179. That means I gotta get that depreciation out of there too. I'm down to $709,702. So because I had to deduct maker's depreciation, that means 179 is limited to $709,702. Okay? So total cost recovery is the million dollars. So think about why that's true. A million dollars? No, it isn't. Total cost recovery is only $750,000. So that's a glitch. Fix that. If I could fix it, I would, but that should be 750,000 right down here. Let's see, since we're here and we're playing, let's do a little annotation. Let's see how my handwriting is. Oh God, it's atrocious. <laughs> you guys get it, 750,000. <laughs> okay, so hopefully that helps. Although I'm not sure why. Yeah. Okay. So uh, that was a mess. All right. Let's close that down. Let's go to our next iteration. Oops. Iteration three. Oh, now I don't know how to get rid of that. Sweet. All right. Erase all ink on slide. Oh, that's cool. All right, thing is, I don't want any of that on there. Well, we're gonna leave it on there for now. All right, iteration three, we've got Andy Summers. Now he spent 2.61 million for the furniture. His income remains at 750,000. Okay, this is iteration three, and I've thrown a different switch. And in this iteration, the switch is, he spent more than the small business limit. Let's see how that works out. So Andy has 2.61 million of 179 eligible property. Is there any, uh, one dollar for dollar reduction due to placing more than the small business limit of two and a half million? The answer is yes. How much more? Well, he's got excess of 110,000. The 179 rules say what you do then is you have to reduce your million by the $110,000 that is phased out. Therefore, the maximum 179 Andy can take in this iteration is only 890,000. Okay, well, does the a remaining eligible amount exceed the annual limit? Well, no, by default it can't, right? I mean, I've already knocked it down below. So that means that everything besides the 890,000 that I'm hoping I can expense, I have to depreciate. 2.61 million minus 890,000, that's 1.72 million to makers depreciate. I can go to my tables, do the calculation. I get maker's depreciation of $245,788. Can Andy deduct the 890,000? Well, we need to check the income limitation. So recall in this case, Andy's income before any cost recovery was 750,000. I know we have a problem. So it's gonna be close. It's not gonna be that close. 750,000, then I get rid of depreciation because I need income before all deductions but 179. That's 504,212. That's how much section 179 Andy's gonna be able to deduct in this case. So you can see that what happened is two of the limitations applied. The first is he blew through the two and a half million. So we needed to phase out the section 179 eligible amount. The second thing that happened is he blew through the income limitation. He had more than his taxable income could absorb. To deduct any more of that would have created a loss. So he was limited to 504,212. The rest of it gets carried forward. Okay. 
A few final thoughts on section 179. The first is it's applied each year to assets placed in service that year only. So you can't say, oh, well, I didn't place anything in service in 2017. I did in 2018, it was more, but I wanna use 2017s in 2018. No, like you do it that year. If you don't take care of it that year, you don't get it. It is elective, okay? So the iterations we went through, Andy elected to deduct as much 179 as he could. So whether he spent a million dollars, $2 million or $50. He can apply any or none of that to 179. So that means he could say, oh, I bought a $50 asset. I could apply 179 to all $50 or to a dollar or to none. It's totally elective. So you would typically think about applying that, therefore, to your longest lived assets. Remember Daniel and Toshland, accelerate, 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 right? Well, if I take 179, on a 20-year asset, I clearly get more bang for my buck than if I take it on a five-year asset. That's generally true. It's actually not true in all cases. And there's a cool homework problem you're going to have to work through that forces you to do that. All right. Again, you do not have to elect the eligible amount. You can use a dollar or up to your eligible amount. The eligible amount is, of course, in 2018, no more than a million dollars. So the limit is taxable income after all deductions except 179. All deductions except 179. The three iterations we just went through, all considered taxable income before cost recovery. Then we deducted cost recovery to get to what was the amount left for section 179. This is an important distinction because the book makes a simplifying assumption in its homework and examples. And it says taxable income before 179. Now, practically speaking, pragmatically speaking, you do not know what that is until you've decided how much 179 you can take. So it's actually not plausible to know what taxable income is before 179 until determining 179. But the book makes that simplifying assumption. So when you're working on homework problems or you're working on exam problems, be sure you pay very careful attention to whether that problem says the taxable income before cost recovery or the taxable income before section 179 because those are clearly different amounts. Okay, so that's just fair warning because that's always confusing. All right. So this carryover provision, we mentioned it briefly, right? So if my section 179 is limited by income, I can carry it forward to the next year. And I, I bring this point up because, okay, that's great. That's how the math works. But think about it. How long can you continue to acquire property for which the income limitation prevents you from deducting it kind of without going out of business? right? Like at some point you need those assets to convert to income. And so what I would say is the carryover provision can be helpful, but only in a very short time, right? Because eventually you just run out of money. Okay. Number two, right? So that's 179. And 179, it, look, I'm not gonna lie, that thing's a beast, man. That's just brutal. It just hurt. It hurts deep inside to do 179 calculations. So you're going to have some buttes as part of your homework. The second one is bonus depreciation. Okay, so first I want to talk about bonus depreciation in 2017 because, again, that's what's in the book. That's not what applies anymore, but you need to understand it. So bonus depreciation has come and gone. So it started back under George H.W. Bush and then was around for a couple years during a recession, then it disappeared. Then post 9-11, George W. Bush brought it back for a couple years, and then it disappeared, and then we hit the financial crisis, and Obama brought that thing back in a big way. And so what you're seeing in 2017 was the final iteration before they kind of decided to get serious about it. But the, in the final iteration, if you place something in service in 2017, you could deduct half of its cost as depreciation in the year you placed it in service. That's what bonus depreciation is. And so what it said is the old table, the rules in 2017 said, if you place it in service in 2017, you can deduct half of its cost. 
If we got to 2018, if you placed some other asset in place in 2018, you could deduct 40% of its cost in the year you placed it in service, then 30%, then zero. So what was happening is we had this bonus depreciation that super accelerated depreciation, but it was phasing out over time. The idea is, well, hopefully we will have worked out of our financial situation by then and it should be fine. So those were around in 2017, but then we got to the new rules. Well, first, I guess we got to discuss what is qualifying property for bonus depreciation. So tangible property with a life, life less than 20 years, that's mostly personal property, mostly personal property. There are a few buildings with a 20 year life, they're farm buildings, greenhouses, thing like, things like that. I'm never going to ask you about those things, but I can't technically say it's only personal property. It's mostly personal property. Okay, computer software qualifies qualified leasehold property. Qualified leasehold property, uh, we'll talk about it in a second, but it's not that important. I'm not really going to make you jump through that hoop. So in 2017, bonus property applied only to new property, and it applied to both business or production of income activities. Now we need to get to the 2018 rules. Okay, so in December, well, I shouldn't say that. Back in September, when they were called the party of six, they got together and said, we're doing tax reform. They, everyone knew that bonus depreciation going to 100% was going to be part of the tax reform. And so rather than say, well, we're not exactly sure what we're going to do, they made a promise that said, if we do tax reform, we're going to allow you to use 100% bonus depreciation on anything you place in service after today. Because the reason would be is if you thought bonus depreciation of 100% was going to start in January of 18, you just wouldn't buy anything in the fourth quarter of the year. Because you'd be like, okay, well, what good is half a year's worth of depreciation when I can take 100% of that thing if I wait till next year? So in order to make sure that the economy didn't stop, people didn't stop investing in capital property, they said, well, look, we'll promise that after September 27th, we'll let you bonus depreciation. So the 2018 rules are anything placed in service after September 27th of 2017, you can write off when you place it in service. That's 100%. That's true in 2018. That's true in 2019. That's true in 2020. That's true in 2021 and 2022. In 2023, that scales back to 80. Then it goes to 60. Then it goes to 40, 20, and then finally back to zero. Now, there's no reason to predict what bonus depreciation is going to be, frankly, as far out as 2021. But this is currently the way the law is written. Okay, so you deduct the applicable percentage in the year you place it in service. Qualifying property under 2018 rules. Tangible property with life less than 20 years. Computer software. Qualified improvement property. So recall that qualified improvement property was the property where you did an improvement on a non-residential real property. That was supposed to be in here, but Congress failed. And so it's not in there. New and used property are now eligible for bonus depreciation. And again, business or production of income activities are both okay. So Gina places in service $400,000 machine in 2017. Uh, seven year life, half year, and let's ignore uh, section 179 for now, okay? Bonus depreciation in 2017 would have been 400,000 times 50%. I'm assuming this took place before September 27th. So she would have written off 200,000. The remaining balance can also be depreciated that year. So she take the 200,000, run it through the maker's tables, another 28,580. As a result, her total cost recovery in 2017 under those rules, would have been 228,580. Still not bad, right? Over 50% recovered in the first year. If she does this in 2018, she just writes off the whole thing. Second, she places it in service. Bonus depreciation is the bomb because it just makes depreciation so much easier, right? So you can see she just writes the whole thing off. Total cost recovery, 400,000. Her adjusted basis at the end is zero. It's all recovered. So you can also combine bonus depreciation with Section 179. If you do so, that has to occur in the following order. First, you apply 179, then you apply bonus, then you apply makers. Now, in the 2018 world, 
this is really unlikely to ever occur because bonus is 100%. In the 2017 world, where bonus was only 50%, then this might occur. So let's just do an example, but you don't have to pay a ton of attention to it. So Gina places in service the following property. Okay, so we got a machine for 2 million, a computer for 50,000, and a copier for 8,000. All placed in service in 2017, all before that magical September 27th date. So first she's going to apply 179. So she says, all right, the total of everything placed in service is 2,058,000. That would have been 28,000 above the section 179 limit for 2017, which was 2,030,000. That leaves 482,000 eligible for 179. She would apply that to the longest live machine. That's uh, the longest live asset. That's the machine. So that would leave 1.518 million of depreciable basis for the machine. Now she take bonus of 50% on each of those. So here's how that workout would look in tab tabular form. So there's the machine, 2 million. She's going to take section 179 of 482. Depreciable basis of 1.518. Multiply 50% times all three assets, take half of them, because again, 2017 rules. The other half is subject to makers. And you can see the total cost recovery over there on the right is the combination of 179 bonus and depreciation, all three. So you could in fact take all three in the year. Again, if this were 2018, I'd be looking at this and I'd say machine, 100% bonus. Computer, 100% bonus. Copier, 100% bonus, it's all written off, we're done, right? Total cost recovery, 2,058,000, adjusted basis, zero in all assets. All right, so we kind of love this accelerated depreciation. So a few years ago, Mr. Krabs bought a computer for the Krusty Krab, and the Krusty Krab used the computer for a year. And then afterward, he converted it to the computer to personal use. So it was a laptop, maybe it was a desktop, whatever. He pulled that thing out of the Krusty Krab, took it home, right? So now depreciation on the computer stops, right? Because personal use assets are not eligible for cost recovery. Only business and production of income assets are eligible for depreciation. So he realizes he was unable to deduct the entire cost of the computer. So of course, he comes up with a crazy idea. He says, look, I'm going to buy a new computer. This time, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use either bonus depreciation or Section 179, whichever one I'm eligible for, and I'm going to deduct the entire cost of the computer in the first year. Then I'm going to convert it to personal use property. As a result, I will have deducted the entire cost of that computer, even though I'm really using it for personal use. Sweet gig, right? Totally not permitted. So when you convert what they call excess depreciation property to less than 50% business use, you have to recapture the excess depreciation that you would have taken if you had just taken maker's depreciation for the entire life of that property, whatever it is. Okay, so let's say we have a computer with a five-year life and it costs $1,000. And if I went to the maker's table and I said, look, I just have to apply straight up maker's depreciation on that, that would have been $200 in the first year. Now, recall that Mr. Crab said, oh, I'm taking 179 or bonus. It doesn't matter. Either one. I'm writing off the whole thing. So now that he's converted that, he has to recapture or basically add back the $800 he's not eligible for. Therefore, he adds $800 of income to the tax return because that's recapturing that excess depreciation he's not entitled to due to the conversion of the property. All right, so Mr. Krabs isn't too worried. He says, you know what? There's a lot of business assets that I use for personal use, right? I, I use them all the time. I use them all the time, but I use them frequently for personal use and no one ever says anything to me, right? Because it's so hard to audit, right? How much did I use my business laptop for work? How much did I use it for personal? Eh, hard to say, isn't it? Right? How much did I use my car for work? How much did I use it for personal? Eh, hard to say, isn't it? And the auditor's not going to follow you around and be like, I saw you doing email. Was that personal email or work email? Right? That just can't happen. So IRS said, you know what? We know that you guys abuse some forms of property. We know you do it. 
Like it's just flat out. We know you do it. Right. And we're not accusing everyone of doing it, but rather than get into fights over whether or not you use that particular property for personal use or business use, we're just going to limit it. We're going to limit it by putting it on a list. And so they have this list of property that they're not very inventive down at the service. And so they just call it listed property. And listed property is property that are subject to these types of abuses. So think of it similar to meals and entertainment. Recall that meals and entertainment, meals are limited to 50%. And now entertainment's just flat out not deductible because they knew the taxpayers abused those two things. Okay, so what's on the list? Any passenger auto weighing less than 6,000 pounds. So 6,000 is a lot. So that's a lot of autos, right? Any other property used as a means of transportation. So truck, bus, boat, airplane, motorcycle, vehicles used to transport goods, all those are listed property. And any property generally used for entertainment, recreation, or amusement. Those are all on the listed property list. Uh, computers, believe it or not, were actually removed by the Tax Cuts and Job Act. So I think what happened is the IRS got tired of dealing with the fact that no taxpayer was using a computer as listed property. So it's like, eh, we just give up. You win. So computers were removed from the list. So what's so special about listed property? As it turns out, not really that much. Okay. If the business use is more than 50%, so if the business use is, pri or if the use is primarily business, then you just depreciate using makers. So really, there's nothing different about it. If it's not used more than 50% for business, then you are required to use the straight line depreciation method. That's it. That's all that's unique about listed property. So if Mike places in service listed property, five-year, half-year convention of $1,000 and he uses it 55% for business, well, 1,000 times 55 is 550. So think of it as of that asset, the business use portion of it is $550. He uses straight up makers depreciation. So it goes to the table, half your life, five years, first year, 20%. He takes $110 of maker's depreciation on it, right? So that's just applying typical makers to a partial business use asset. If, on the other hand, he uses it 45% for business, well, now it's not predominantly used in business. 450 of it is business use. He actually has to go to the straight line table. Straight line table would say, well, it's only 10%. If you look first year, five year property, 10%, he can only deduct $45. So that's all that's magical about listed property. It's not really that big of a deal. If it's less than 50% business use, you have to use straight line. Kind of done. All right. So what if listed property starts above 50%? but then drops below 50%. So this is similar to Mr. Krabs and his computer, right? So I used it in year one, it was listed property, right? And I, and I took, you know, accelerated depreciation, but then by year two, I was using it less than 50% for business. The same sort of recapture rule applies. Um, you have to go back and compute it as if it was straight line the entire life. So again, there's a cool homework problem on that. These are the steps you follow. I'm not going to get into it. All right, we're not quite done with Krabs yet. So Krabs has an auto he uses for business. And he's not cheating, right? He's legitimately using it for business. So recall, Mr. Krabs, he's a single dude right? He really only needs a smaller commuting car for his business and pre presumably something with a small carbon footprint, right? Now, I, Krabs doesn't strike me as the kind of guy that cares a whole lot about carbon, but what else? So maybe he should really be using a, a Prius or a Civic, but you know, he's Krabs. He's a single dude. He's got to keep his rep intact. So he settles on a Cadillac Escalade, right? Because he wants to roll, man. And don't forget, his daughter's a whale, his girlfriend is a puffer fish. They're both giant. So maybe he just wants the bigger car. So as a result, he gets to depreciate and therefore deduct a $70,000 vehicle instead of a $20,000 vehicle. So go back to chapter nine, ordinary and necessary. And it said, necessary needs to be reasonable. But we talked about this in the lecture. We said, you know what? The IRS is pretty hands-off. They run pretty loose on deductions. And if Crab says he needs the Escalade, we're going to let him buy the Escalade. I mean, after all, it costs 70 grand, not 20 grand. Okay, so that makes Al Gore pissed off, 
right? So in the old days, there was a limit. Now this limit still exists. It's just a little bit looser than it used to be. So section 280F says, if you buy a luxury auto, we're gonna limit the amount of depreciation you can deduct each year. So a little history on this code section. Back in 87, it was enacted. The average cost of a new car back then, unbelievably, was only $9,700. Luxury, so when these limits kicked in, is when you purchased a car that cost more than $12,800. Hard to believe that would have been a luxury car back then, but I was alive back then. It was, trust me. And you can see there's about like a 25% premium. So they're kind of picking it up when your car was more than 25% of the average cost. They consider that luxury. They were going to limit your depreciation. Today, the average price of a car is about 28000 In 2017, the depreciation limitations kicked in at 15.8. Now, you don't need to know those rules. Don't worry about them. I'm just letting you know that they forgot to consider what luxury was. So what happened is, as we had worked our way through time through 2017, every car was a luxury car every car was subject to a depreciation limit. That clearly wasn't in the mind of the Congress when they wrote this rule back in 87. But what happened is we had bonus depreciation. And so one of the ways they dealt with this temporarily is they said, hey, we're gonna increase the limit. If you take bonus depreciation, we're gonna increase the limit. So these are the 2017 limits that applied. And you can see that if you place something in service in 2017, in the first year, your limit was $11,160. That's how much depreciation you could take on that particular auto in year one. Then in year two, 5,100, then 3050, and then every year thereafter, $1,875. So what this did is it restricted your ability to recover the cost of a, uh, I got air quotes around this, luxury auto. Okay, if you did not elect bonus, the first year was only 3,160. So I'm not sure why they put that bonus kicker in, but they did. And so the reality is uh, your limit was only $3,160 if you elected out of bonus depreciation in 2017. 2018 came around and they said, you know what? These limits are redonkulous because the limits are redonkulous. They're way too low. And so they said, you know what? We're going to take those up. We're going to make it 18,000 in year one, 16,000 in year two, 9,600 in year three, and then 5,760 every year thereafter. So basically we're saying, look, you should be able to get a more expensive car. Now, if you elect out of bonus, so if you see some homework problems where they say, the taxpayer did not elect bonus or elected out of bonus depreciation, then the limit is only 10,000 in 2018. But still, 10,000 is way more than 3,160. All right, we need to do some examples. Luke, Han, and Yoda place in service the following autos. They're all in separate businesses. So these, these guys don't work together. They just all happen to coincidentally place an auto in service uh, during the year. So Luke's car costs 10000 He's a Jedi. Uh, Hans costs 25000 Think of that as the Millennium Falcon. Yoda, that dude's just a badass, so he bought a $70,000 car. The business use is 100% across the board. So we can assume autos are five-year and half-year convention applies, and that none of these guys elected bonus depreciation. Okay, so if none of them elect bonus depreciation, then the first step we do is we calculate what would regular depreciation be. So if you look in the third column where it says depreciation, that would be regular depreciation. So five-year, half-year convention, it's 20%. 10,000 times 20%, 2,000. 2,500 times, or 25,000 times 20%, 5,000. 70,000 times 20%, 14,000. That's the depreciation you would like to take. What's the limit? Well, remember the limit in 2018, if you elect out of bonus depreciation is 10,000. So if you look at Luke, that has no effect on him, right? He can still deduct his $2,000. If you look at Han, has no effect on him. His actual depreciation is lower than the limit. So he'll deduct 5,000. Yoda, on the other hand, his actual depreciation was 14,000. His limit is 10,000. He may only deduct 10,000 in the first year. Okay, so that's how that limitation works. So what if Yoda only uses his car 60% for business, which is entirely plausible. So you take the 70,000 multiplied by 60%. His depreciable basis is 42,000. 
times 20%, right? That's the depreciation factor. That's 8,400. Well, wait a second, 8,400, that's less than 10,000. No depreciation limitation, right? Incorrect. You also must adjust the limit by the business use percent. So if his limit was 10,000, he has to multiply that by the same 60% as his business use. Therefore, his limit is only 6,000 and it is limited to the $6,000. Okay, uh, da, 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 da. let's pretend they do take bonus, right? So this is the same example, except now they're gonna take bonus depreciation. Okay, so if Luke buys a car, it costs 10,000, bonus depreciation, he expenses all of it, that's 10,000. What's his limit? 18,000. He can deduct all 10. Han has 25,000. He wants to take all of it as bonus depreciation, but he cannot take all of it as bonus depreciation. His limit is 18,000. As a result, he only writes off 18,000 of the cost. The remaining 7,000 has to be depreciated. We're going to talk about how that happens in a second. Yoda buys a car for 70000 Same thing there. His actual depreciation, who cares what it is? He's taking bonus depreciation. He'd like to write off all 70000 but it's going to be limited to 18000 Okay. So the problem is, let's think about, let's start with Han. So Han has a $25,000 car. He takes bonus depreciation of 18000 in the first year. What happens with the remaining 7000 in years two and beyond? right? So you would think it would be a simple matter of, oh, you just apply the maker's calculation for year two and make sure it doesn't exceed the limitation in year two. But that is not how it is done. When they wrote the code, they made a mess of things. So there was a revenue procedure back in 2011 that was the last time we had 100% bonus depreciation. And most taxpayers are relying on that, at least for the time being. I'm only letting you know because by the time you graduate, they probably will have worked out a resolution to this. This does not require a technical correction to the law. It simply requires the IRS to fix it. Um, whether they get to that this year or not is debatable. So right now, we'll just worry about first year's depreciation on 2018 cars with bonus depreciation. Okay, So hopefully that saves you a little bit of pain and suffrage. All right, we've already done partial business use uh, versions, but let's do one more just for, for safety's sake. So let's say that I have a five-year asset that costs $1,000. So let, let's say this is a computer, right? And for this computer, I use it 55% for my business. I own a rental property. So for 30% of that computer's use, I use it for my rental property. That's for the production of income. And 15% of it is just flat-out personal use. So I just use it for surfing the internet or whatever. So if I could break that asset down, that's what it would look like. So what I like to do is actually break that asset down. So the first thing I would do is think about, well, how much could I recover under 179, right? Because it's possible that I could recover the cost of this under 179. Well, only the portion used for trader business is eligible. The trader business portion was 55%. That's 550 bucks. So assuming that I don't have a small business limitation, assuming that I don't have an income limitation, I would be able to deduct all 550 under section 179. 300 of that is eligible for makers. That's the 30% related to production of income. So that portion, I would run through the depreciation tables. I'd get another 60 bucks. The last 150, that's for personal use personal use property is non-depreciable. Okay, so I guess before we flip off this si slide, let me make a couple things clear. I can also use 100% bonus depreciation on this. So the 100% would apply both to the business portion and the production of income portion. So under those auspices, I could write off the 850 as bonus depreciation in year one. The 150 remains non-depreciable under bonus, under 179, under any system at all. All right. So I've used these terms, trader business versus production of income uh, a couple times. And we even talked about it in the last module. And we're not going to tear this apart too much because frankly, it's too complicated for this course. But it relates largely to the degree of activity or involvement you have in an activity. And these are not the same as the material participation tests that relate to passive versus non-passive. These are different tests.
So let's say Jane is a chef and she owns a restaurant. And anyone who knows anything about the food service business knows that the people that run those businesses spend their lives there. So yeah, she spends more than 40 hours a week at her restaurant and she actually generates the bulk of her income from her restaurant activity. That means that's her trader business. But Jane also owns a condo. Let's say she owns a condo in PB, right? And she advertises for tenants from time to time, but frankly doesn't spend a significant amount of her time managing the condo, right? When she needs a new tenant, she has to spend a little time. If the toilet breaks, she's got to call a plumber, but she doesn't really spend the majority of her time there. There's a spider crawling up my arm. Can you guys see that? Creepy. There he goes. Uh, goodbye, Charlotte. Um, we call that production of income, right? So it's, a, it's an activity that she's involved in related for business, but it simply doesn't reach the level of a trader business. We generally call that production of income. Okay. Our last part to this chapter, I have no idea how long we've been going, but I'm sure it's way too long. Oh yeah, holy cow. All right, amortization. So, and remember, we got a whole nother chapter after this. So for intangible assets, uh, businesses recover the cost of the asset through amortization. So intangible assets are things like capitalized research and experimentation, uh, covenants not to compete, uh, patents, trademarks. These are things that there's no tangible. You can't touch a trademark, right? It's just a piece of paper that legally gives you the right to use it. That's why that's called an intangible, right? <clears throat> Sorry. So intangible assets have one of the following characteristics. They are either a section 197 intangible. And again, I wish I had a better name for you. And I wish 197 wasn't so damn close to 179, but it is. So we'll talk about what a 197 intangible is in a little bit. Startup, and expen startup expenditures and org costs are intangibles. Research and experimentation costs and then patents and copyrights. Those are kind of the big four, right? So these are the ones you're most likely to run into. Let's start with 197 intangibles. So a 197 intangible is an intangible that you acquire when a business acquires another business, not just an individual intangible asset. So the example I typically think of is if I went out and bought a biotech startup company, I'm probably buying it because it has a patent on a drug. I could have just bought the patent on the drug. If I acquire the whole business, if I acquire the entire startup company, then that patent is a section 197 intangible. If on the other hand, I simply acquire the patent, it is not a section 197 intangible. Okay, so under code section 197, the distinction is that you will recover the cost of that intangible over 180 months, which is 15 years, irrespective of what the actual useful life of that intangible is. You use the full month convention. So remember we had half year, mid quarter, mid month. Amortization uses a full month convention, which means if I place it in service on the first day of the month, I take the whole month. If I place it in service in the middle of the month, I take the whole month. If I place it in service on the last day of the month, I take the whole month. Always the whole month. Uh, let's see. Whoops. So Greta purchases a business for a million dollars and she allocates the cost to the following assets. So this is some classic purchase accounting, right? So 200,000 goes to the land, 400,000 goes to the factory. She buys a patent for a hundred that has a market value of a hundred thousand. That patent has a 14 year remaining life and Goodwill is the, as you know, the what's left over, right? So for uh, Presumably you've covered that in your financial. So there's her total million dollar cost. And the question is, there are two intangibles in that group. There's a patent and there's Goodwill. How do I amortize those costs? Well, they're both 197 intangibles. These were both acquired as part of a trade or business acquisition. Therefore, they're both going to be amortized over 15 years starting in the month of the acquisition. Startup and org costs are a little bit different. So let's reflect back on what we remember about code section 162. You can deduct all ordinary and necessary business expenses. When do you start being in business? What do you do with costs you incur before you are technically 
in business. Those are startup and org costs, and we need to find a way to deal with those, right? So the general would be, well, look, they're non-deductible. You just got to capitalize them. But the tax code said, well, wait a second. That's kind of a tough, like you're just starting your brand new business. And the first thing I'm going to do is shellack you by not letting you deduct the costs of the very first things you incurred. So Congress said, you know, that's not really fair. So we're going to find a treatment for these that we think is a little fair. So basically, org costs are the costs required to organize a corporation or a partnership. So things like the cost of organizational meetings, any state fees you got to pay, accounting costs you got to pay that are incidental to the organization, any legal services. So kind of any of the costs of organizing the corporation except the cost of selling or marketing shares for ownership. So the one thing you can't, you can't is your syndication costs, as they call them. So I'm not going to get in the way the capital markets fluctuate, but uh, when someone has to go out and get subscriptions on your shares, you pay them. Uh, the reality is that cost is not a startup or organizational cost. Startup costs are the cost to start a business. So these are costs associated with investigating a trade or business that are pre-operating. You incur them before you're in the business. Cost recovery works the same for both org costs and startup costs, though you bucket them separately. The general rule is you amortize them over 15 years. However, there's a small business deduction. This small business deduction works a little bit like Section 179 worked. So the first is the, the code says, you know, we'll let you deduct up to $5,000 worth the startup and organizational costs. So if you have to go pay your lawyer $3,500 to get your incorporated, you know, you go to LegalZoom.com and you get your articles of incorporation written up and some corporate bylaws written up and you file them with the state and that costs $3,500 we'll let you just go ahead and deduct that $3,500 because we're looking out for the small business guy and we want to make sure that he's covered and that he can deduct those costs. But the design behind that expensing is it's only for small businesses. So what we're going to do is we're going to phase it out when you're not a small business. In this case, the definition of small business is when your startup or your org costs exceed 50000 The second you get the $50,001, then you need to phase out dollar for dollar that $5,000. Don't worry, we're going to do an example. V Corp incurs organizational costs of $4,000. They start business on April 13. How are they going to recover those organizational costs for tax? All right, so $4,000 is less than the $5,000 limit, so they are a small business. They just write off all $4,000, immediate deduction. Sweet. What if the org costs were $7,000? Okay. Well, it's still below 50000 so they're still a small business, so they can deduct up to 5000 That leaves 2000 left to amortize over 15 years or 180 months, so they take the 2000 divided by 180. They started in April, full month uh, convention, so all nine months, so 2000 divided by 180 times nine gives them their amortization for the year, and so they'd add that amortization to the 5000 what if the org costs are $51,000? Okay, well, now we're in excess, right? We're in excess of the $50,000 threshold by 50, by 1,000, right? 51 minus the 50,000. So that means I have to reduce the 5,000 down to 4,000. Now, I can still expense the 4,000. So if I expense 4,000, that leaves me 47,000 left to amortize over 180 months. So 47,000 divided by 180 times nine months during this year. What if org costs are 56,000? Well, 56,000 is 6,000 in excess. I am no longer eligible for any of the small business expensing. All 56,000 just gets amortized over 180 months. So you can see it does feel, look and feels a lot like the section 179 phase out. All right, so if I changed any of these words from org costs to startup costs, the calculation works the same. It is identical, right? And again, you treat them separately. You do not combine them together into one lump sum. I categorize all my org costs. How do I treat them? Boom, I go through this process. I categorize all my startup costs. I run them through this 5,000, 50,000 phase out mill just like I did the others. Okay, we are getting close now. R&E costs. 
So R&E costs can either be deducted or capitalized, okay? So if I capitalize my R&E costs, then I have to amortize them for a period as soon as I start using whatever that is I spent them on, and I have to amortize it in no less than five years or 60 months. If I end up converting those costs into a patent, then now I amortize that over the useful life of the patent. Okay, so before we go any farther, let's talk about R&E for a second. And because we're in San Diego, let's talk about it from the perspective of someone in biotech who's developing a new drug. Okay, so I'm out trying to develop a new drug and developing a new drug can cost millions of dollars. I have no idea whether that thing's going to work or not. In the uh, accounting world, we call that R&D expense. And you should recall that from your accounting rules under GAAP, you just expense R&D costs. For tax purposes, the rule is generally like, well, wait a second, that's bad matching, right? I shouldn't let you expense R&D up front because you may never create income. So we're going to let you amortize or capitalize that cost if you want to. You don't have to. You can deduct it. If you want to capitalize it, you can. Okay, so I've capitalized these costs, like all my experimentation costs. I got lab costs. I'm testing it on rats, and then I'm testing it on people, and I'm trying to get it through the FDA approval process. And ultimately, I realize, you know what? I think this thing's going to become a drug. And so I go out and file for a patent, and I get a patent on that drug. The second I get that patent, I start to amortize these costs, all the costs I incurred for my, my lab rats and my people and my testing. I start amortizing that over the useful life of that patent, okay? Now, let's take a little different approach and say, I spent all that money, and it turns out, yeah, I don't think I'm really going to be able to get a drug out of this, right? I tested it on rats, and it killed all the rats. Bummer. But there's some of the chemical compound that I have underneath there that I think is useful for something. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start using that chemical compound to build some other products out that I think are helpful or are going to be helpful. Well, now I've started to benefit, but there's no patent. So I need to amortize that over no less than 60 months. That's what they're talking about. Patents and copyrights. Now, remember, if they're not part of a business, if they're part of a business acquisition, they're 197 intangibles. Otherwise, you just amortize those over their useful life or their remaining life, as the case may be. So, let's say that I get my drug patent up and I patent it. But look, I'm a biotech. I'm in the startup business, man. I don't want to market and sell drugs. I'm going to turn that over to the bigs. So, what I want is for Bayer or one of the big pharmaceutical companies to come in and buy my drug. So they come in and buy my drug three years after I patented it. It only has 14 years left on its life. That's part of a patent that they bought not as part of a business. They're just going to amortize that over that remaining 14 years. Okay, here's a nice summary of amortization. Um, it's right out of the book. I think it's helpful. So be sure you take a look at that before you get too far along. All right, that brings us to the end of chapter 10. Holy cow, two hours into this. I need a break. I'm losing my voice. So I'm going to be back in about five minutes. So I'm going to cut off my camera. Uh, I'm going to mute my, my headset and I'll be back in a few minutes.